Let's welcome Mark Ronson to the show. I would love to kind of talk about the first time I uh, heard about you. I had just moved to New York City. I think it was like late 90s. And I had met some friends who took me to the nightclub life. And Mm. I got to hear you DJ when it was probably like... uh, Puffy, Kate Moss, in one booth, and Jay-Z, Dame Dash, and uh, Biggs, and Naomi Campbell in another booth, in like a small condensed area, and there was this DJ playing like an amalgamation of The Strokes, uh, M.O.P., Jay-Z, Ace Freely, um, and I was just like blown away, like, oh my God, New York City's the best place on the planet. I need to come to this nightclub every <laughs> single night. And I just got like, it was like by a stroke of luck that I ended up in one of those nightclubs, like, and being able to listen in on that kind of music and, and at the yeah. same time having a great time. And I just feel like that, like, represented my New York experience was being able to go to those kind of uh, clubs and appreciating what I love and what, what made me actually love New York City. Yeah. It was an incredible era, actually, because I was coming up under this whole legacy of New York DJs, like especially downtown DJ Stretch Armstrong and Duke of Denmark and these guys that, you know, merge this scene of what's so great about downtown New York, which is like musicians, artists, rappers, drug dealers, models, skateboarders, like everything. And obviously that's how hip hop kind of started in a way, like uptown meets downtown. And you think of the rock scene when we picture Blondie and Bambada and this stuff. But that was 20 years later, here I was in the middle of this scene that was just sort of burgeoning again. And um, it was incredible because I was playing at this club life and it was a sort of downtown like quote unquote model type hangout and then it was just at the moment that Puff and Jay-Z and everybody were like just discovering this downtown scene you know they'd gone to the tunnel they knew about all the other clubs and at first I'm not gonna lie like the club owners were not psyched like they were like let's just be real like they were racist and there would be meetings I went in there and I play hip-hop every Friday night and they would start to come down and they would be like they would have these club meetings Tuesday night Mark Ronson and his brand of music are ruining (laughs) the clientele of our club or whatever the fuck and uh and but it was it was amazing and no one could deny it and it was this thing and, and i was in this little dj booth that was like by the stairs like i was essentially like coat check you know like i wasn't like in the middle there were no stages back then and i could just see every who would come down the stairs down that vi into this vip room that i was dj and it was like i was a 23 year old kid and i'm watching like rick rubin chris rock prince puffy jay-z like my mm-hmm. heroes like coming down about to like spend the night in the club like go to their little table and where they decamp for the night and i remember the night you were talking about it was crazy because it was was Puff and like all the bad boy crew were at one table and then Jay and Damon Dash and Biggs were all at another table so I just started going one for one Biggie bad I mean uh, Rockefeller bad boy Rockefeller bad boy and I'm sure there were a good number of Pharrell tunes in that set and it was just fun and they were just kind of sh- like pointing at each other and kind of like jeering and sh- talking but having such a great time it was all in such good fun and uh it was a really it was a pretty magical time in in new york this is like just the turn of i can't believe turn of the century i feel like we're talking about like some (laughs) age of the innocence movie but it was the turn of the century it was just the 21st century but 99 into 2000 such an amazing time for records and and uh and and music and clubs in new york wow that sounds amazing it was it was. It was. Yeah, actually, I, like, I wanted to ask. I was. wanted to ask Pharrell. Like, do you think that you experiencing that uh, had any influence on making uh, nerd albums? Mm. Yeah, of course, of course. It was. Um, I think because it's right around the same time. Yeah, it is. Um, nerd was like, 
a mixture of I'm doing it for all the kids who were like me and our, all of our friends who were pluralist and who colored outside the lines. But then there was the mixture of like being exposed to the North. And, you know, like Mark said, like it was like a, that, you know, life and what was the other one? Plaid. Yeah, that's Plaid. Plaid was like one week it was Key Club, then it was System, then it was Cat Club, then it was, <laughs> I think every week they had to change the address on the flyer or something. It was like. crazy. <laughs> to answer Scott's question, I was still in disbelief. I might have acted like I was cool and like, oh yeah, I'm here, yeah, what's up, what's up? Yeah, all right, cool. But in my mind, it was a dream. I, I was, you know, doing 19 million backflips. <laughs> um, and as much as you would see Puff and Jay, you gotta understand, at this time, like they're, they're icons now, but mm -hmm. they were like titans at that time. You know, mm -hmm. that Jay, yeah. Jay was yeah. still hitting you with freestyles. He'd just go up to flex for no reason. Wow. You know, that, <laughs> that era of... That crazy era. <laughs> you know, just with the bars, yeah. you know, and, um, and Puff was doing whatever he wanted. This is before Ciroc. This is just like Titan Puff. Titan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, I just remember being around that, and that made me feel different, and so my music felt different. So I was really trying to push it, you know? I mean, it really did tie in with like the the explosion of those first records of yours and Chad's that were just so massive. So like, I can remember like the energy of dropping how Clips or Nori or NERD records or Got Your Money would change the molecules in the room, the excitement. I think like, I mean, I, I'm about to turn this into like my interview on you for this thing but I, I honestly like the way that those records were um it just like it was it was a magic time because you just had all those you were changing the sound of what club and dj music was at the same time as this exciting scene exploding in new york and you had great records with jay-z and puff as well so it was kind of like they were all inextricable in some lovely way you know wow well thank you that's like, um, you know, everything comes and goes in waves. And, um, you know, if you think about like MIA, CeeLo, Andre 3000, you know, those kinds of artists, they're mm -hmm. like characters. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always wanted to be one. I've always been like a wannabe. Like I always wanted to be one of those guys. Um, a character. Yeah, a character. Um, but I was always ended up like, I was always like the guy standing next to the guy. Um, and I didn't realize that that was a character. It yeah. took me a long time to figure out like, oh, <laughs> I am a character. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I'm more like a chameleon because I can turn into this and I can turn into that and I can turn into this. But I mean, I didn't know and I still don't know. I'm, I'm just now like figuring it out. At that time, everything was the same. So there was a lot of stuff that was really like sounding alike. In the era. Yeah, okay. so it just gave you the opportunity to come with something super fresh. But when you do those things, you gotta have, you need a Justin to do it. You know, you need a Jay-Z to do it. You, yeah. need, you need a Mystical to do it. You need yeah. a Puff to do it. But still. So, so those records that, what he's talking about when he said like change the energy in the room, mm -hmm. it's like, it was unique and it was like, and we strive for them to be undeniable. Gotcha. So that's like that, that thing. Whereas I feel like right now, literally right now, I think people are ready for some disruption. Mm -hmm. But I always enjoy those things. And to me, it all, you know, every five or six years, something, so, but, if there's room for you to, there's room in the ether, ether for you to just like chainsaw the air mm -hmm. and let in. Yeah. You know, the bomb. Oh, yes. Yeah, but look, let me ask you this. So, like, just picturing that, like, what Mark said, that, which is the crazy 
Yeah, but he was like, he was in the DJ booth and he seen Prince, Jay Z, like you. That's um, that's crazy already. Mm -hmm. So you was there and you felt that, and you was like, it was like a dream. What? How did you have the courage to change that? Like instead of just like, yo, these are the titans. These are the ones who know how to do this. I'm loving it. This is the great. How did you know to like disrupt it? How did you know that it, it, it for one, could be disrupted and two, needed it? You was young too. I was young and arrogant. So that had a lot to do with it, you mm -hmm. know? Arrogance had a lot to do with it. Um, but I but, think the thing that always seemed to me as well was that because you guys were from Virginia Beach as well, it mm -hmm. felt like it felt like a spaceship that like landed on New York, like it was so <laughs> fully formed. It wasn't like you you kind of like slowly discover the sound. It's like it's a hint of where it's going now, and then it was just like it was really just. I remember playing in clubs. Maddie C and Scott Free, who's like basically signed Wu Tang, they were the coolest like NR guys that would like come and bring you like mob deep white labels. And they just came through with their like, yo, have you heard this Nori record, Super Thug? And I was mm. like, no. And it was like, it was, it was a brand new alien sound. Like it was, it wasn't something like, oh, they were evolving. Then they caught it. I mean, I'm sure you guys were evolving because I know you've been making records from before that. But I think, I think that's, that's sort of what it was. And that's what was so exciting to, DJs, people who loved music, anyone who just appreciated anything different, you know, mm -hmm. I think it was just so... Wow. I've heard, I've talked to... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I said, wow, thank you. No, I talked to, like, <laughs> Hank Shockley about it before, and, you know, it, it's even Public Enemy, like, when those records first came out, like, yeah. you couldn't just play a Public Enemy record and then go back into whatever else you were playing. Like, you had to kind of play two or three Public Enemy records in a row because <laughs> yeah. there was nothing that sounded good after a Public Enemy record, really. You couldn't just go back to playing, no offense, but, like, Treacherous 3 or whatever the commercial hip-hop of that mm -hmm. era was. So it's like, that was the same thing with the, with the Neptunes, especially when you guys were starting out. You'd play a little block set because it was just like, yeah, you couldn't just play that and then go back to, you know, whatever the sort of, yeah. the, the hit of the day was. That was actually gonna be my question, is like, how hard was it to blend another song into a Neptune's beat at that time? Well, you just went, da -na 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 -na. you just went, drop. I, I mean, <laughs> listen, I, I, and I would, like, I loved having, like, actually one of my favorite tricks of that thing that people would go nuts was, this is back in the era of vinyl. You had, you couldn't, your your <laughs> tricks couldn't be that tricky because it wasn't Serato, it wasn't CDs. You were really like pretty much beholden to whatever records you could get on quick enough in three seconds to drop the next thing. But the way that Jay-Z mastered the dynasty is that changed the game, went straight into give it to me. Mm. So, I because it goes, I will not lose boom yeah, yeah. right into it so i was like okay so this so i had this sort of routine where it was like i will not lose and dropped cool g rap the ill street blues i don't know if you remember it but it oh, went yeah. i will not lose you lose because you got the ill street blues you yeah, lose yeah, yeah. i will not lose give it to me would come in that was the biggest song of the night the club would like erupt i loved having my little <laughs> Routines and set pieces, you know, I might play Jam Master J into grinding, like just mm -hmm, little yeah. things like that. But um, that's what you did as a DJ to set yourself apart because everybody had the same records. It's just how you put it together. Um, and so I, I love thinking of ways to do that. See, but you, you and Timbaland, and I only realize that now because I'm like talking to you, but you and Timbaland, you all are like kind of like the only ones that well, let me take that back, because somebody would be like, you're wrong, wrong, such and <laughs> yeah. such, he's been around for 30 years, you know, you're such a poor historian. <laughs> but you're you, you and Timberland, Sorry. like, y'all are like super DJs, and then ended up being great producers. Yeah. Like, great producers. I mean, I know Manny Fest is, is a DJ, too. Yeah. Let me just stop, because there's a lot of DJs that turn producer, and they all gonna just look at me crazy. But, I mean, <laughs> listen, bro, the shit that you do, I mean, People know you for Amy Winehouse. Mm -hmm. You know, that Uptown Funk didn't hurt. Killed it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but you do this. Like, and you do this whenever right. you want. You're one of the guys that whenever you feel like making a big record, it's going to feel, it's gonna take you somewhere. And 
it's going to work for the cab driver. You know what I'm saying? It's going to work for, like, the soccer moms. It's going to work for, like, the people staying up to 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning doing shit they ain't supposed to be doing. It's going to work. And that's not, that's not a very easy thing to do. It's one right. thing to be... It's one thing to try to... To, to be able to like identify, go into an era and just like make a record that never existed then that, that should have, you know, which is like one of my f- super fun things to do. Um, but it's another thing to, and, and then achieving that is cool because then it's like, oh man, it's great, you know, he does this 1940s thing, he's really good at it. That's when, I mean, and it takes hard work to really get to that place. Mm-hmm. But imagine saying, oh, I'm gonna make a record from the 1940s, but it's gonna be a number one, you know, top 100 record. That's what you do whenever you feel like it. It's like, that's, right. awesome. that's amazing. Thank and I'm you. saying, I said 40s, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking about this guy's done 50s, 60s, he's done the 70s, he's done the 80s, mm-hmm. he's done the 90s. He makes things that just, you can't even put any kind of error on it. Like, whenever you want, you can just say, oh, I'm gonna make a record for, you know, I'm, making, I'm gonna make the 2030 record right now, and it's gonna sound like that, mm-hmm. and it's gonna take people to that place, and it's, and it's gonna be huge. Right. How how helpful do you think uh, sitting in a DJ booth and seeing people react to other people's music help influence you as a producer? I mean, I think it's probably immeasurable. And, you know, like, I'm sure there was an era when I was playing and like 60 to 70 percent of my set was like Neptune's Timberland premiere. I was probably going to the studio the next day after being up till four in the morning playing records that, that I love genuinely and trying to basically wash that sauce off me because i'm sure i had you know before i made it i had like demos and then the beat tapes that i would take around to whoever that sounded like very much like those things like you know second rate versions of the things that i like because when you're starting in some cases you're you know you're like okay you're you emulate the things that you love right or you emulate the things that you love that you also see working it took me a long time to sort of just find my own find my own lane but DJing in general is is constantly it's it's almost like it's like if you become a lawyer you go to school to study legal precedents right it's not so you can like rip off those things it's so that you always have at hand these 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 previous cases and decisions and stuff when you're thinking about your arguments right well, when you make music it's like I guess there might be a program somewhere in some college where that studies everything from beats to programming to string arrangements to whatever. But really, the other way to get that is just to have an exhaustive knowledge of like of records and just the history of music. And you know, Stevie Wonder talks about it all the time. And you can spot his errors where he was like going in on Baroque or where he went in on Brazilian bossa nova. So I feel like that that's probably what makes a lot of DJs producers or in some ways not necessarily good producers but it sets us up for it because you know we have that index of music and then I think uh yeah I think just feeling what makes people move I think even too much some it was hard to sometimes turn that disco ball off like constantly spinning in my head because when I when I first met Amy and we were working when we worked on Love is a Losing Game this ballad I kept trying to put drums in it and it kept ruining the song and I couldn't find the right drums and then I just had to be like oh no this is supposed to be a ballad but like ballad wasn't in my musical vocab at that point because I was just really like beat beat dance dance like where are the, how are they going to move to this so it's it's you know it's 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 all of those things I guess it's crazy and it's crazy like who how did you who like I know Salam worked on it and Salam has some crazy songs with her as well how did you guys meet her? Like, where did she, how'd that happen? Well, she, Salam met her already because he worked on the first album, Frank. And actually, Salam obviously produced many records that I love, but Made You Look by Nas is one of my favorite beats of all time. So when Salam reworked that beat, when he met Amy, they did a song together on the first album called In My Bed. So I love that. I discovered that in England. Her first record didn't even come out in America. But, you know, I knew about her just from that. So 
when she was coming in through New York for a day on the way back from working with Salam in Miami, someone said like, hey, do you want to work? Do you want to meet this girl, Amy Winehouse? And I was like, let's be honest, I didn't have anything else popping at the time. And I liked that song a lot. So I said, yeah, tell her to come to my studio. So she came up and we just met and we just started talking and i i asked the most obvious question that i thought that you should ask someone i was like what do you want your record to sound like because she had a few things with slam already but i could tell she was still forming it and she said well i really like this 60s stuff they play down at my local which meant like her local pub and uh we, i listened to it and i was like oh this is cool like i like this i had never it was all 60s kind of like almost like movies from music from goodfellas like not motown not soul yeah. like before yeah. that yeah and and uh, and I loved the idea of like, I loved her instantly. And I loved the idea of like trying to do something I had never done before to impress this person and basically make them stay in New York one more night, you know? And then she left that night and I came up with the piano and the, the very bare beat of Back to Black, the song. And she came in the next day and she was like, that's it. That's what I wanted to sound like. So we just, we, that's how we went from there. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. Do you think as producers, is it harder to work with uh, established stars versus a new artist? Everyone's different. You know, sometimes you meet somebody raw and they just know what they want, you know, or they know when they like something that they hear. And other times there are people who like, you meet them for the first time, but they've like, they're three, four albums in and they know exactly what it is that they want. And then there are moments when they just don't know at all, but they know how to trust. So it just, excuse me, it just depends on like who it is and where they are in their process. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, I think that's a part of me if I was going to be really real at this moment is like, the pressure of working with somebody who's already massive or just what the constraints that that sometimes puts on the creative process because you're you're thinking you're matching past sale i mean sales yeah, other records they've made records that you love not just even commercial like working with paul mccartney for example like you're not just in the ghost of all paul mccartney's amazing solo material and then all the beatles but like you're the ghost of every amazing record producer he even worked with, from George mm -hmm. Martin to Elvis Costello to Nigel Godrich. So, like, there's all these other things, but that's my own problem. I should get over that. But I, I also <laughs> love working with new artists because their excitement and their thing to be on their first voyage is so contagious. Like, they're just so excited. For them, like, this blank canvas, the world is their musical oyster. Like, that, that is almost like drinking from the musical fountain of youth like each time you you go to it which is nice and do you think they ever bring in like exposing you to new technology or ways that they like to hear music or the sounds that they like that may change or alter the way or put you onto something that you may want to use in making music for me hell yeah oh i love it i love like working with whatever king princess or whoever it is it's just like got their own way of that they do the harmony engine on their vocals and they're showing me or the ableton learning from kevin from tame impala or diplo like i i've constantly a sponge for that because i'm a little bit of like an analog dude so like i need those people to shake me out of it every now and then and kind of be <laughs> like hey guess what like we invented laptops you know like and it's fun to pick up that do it um Concern you that it's gonna change your, your style at all? Are you are you worried about that at all? Like just changing like the method? I think so. I think sometimes you get, you, you know, like when I've had some periods with like a couple, let's call them flops. Uh, when you've had a few records, like maybe you're a, a couple year a year or two in between your last big records, and you start to be like, well, maybe I should do this or. It doesn't even have to be a couple of years, it could be a few months, but whenever you get to that place where you get that sort of negative self-talk, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and, and you start to switch it up, and I've gone, I've, I've, I think I, it's one thing that I feel comfortable at at 46 years old is no matter how um, things are going to change and there's going to be new sounds and fads and you're not always going to be the person on the on the forefront of like the newish but you learn what you're good at well it's interesting um i was uh, reading something that tori lanes tweeted about 
um, like a week or two ago that none of the big artists that we know today are sticking. And I was just curious what you guys think about, do you think that's true? That like the big artists aren't lasting longer than four to six months? Is that just the, um, a byproduct of how kids listen to music today or mm. the technology that disseminates it? Or is just this just, you know, where we are? that this is how long this music lasts because there's so much of it. I think, um, you know, usual answer every five to ten years is that everyone's doing the same thing. But the new answer, the answer right now, the one that's really interesting, is that everyone is trapped in an algorithm and they're serving these algorithms and they're doing what the algorithm is suggesting is getting the highest hit. Mm -hmm. But the algorithm is going off of, it's like a feedback loop. The alg algorithm is just looking at what's going on right now. So if they don't lead and go against it, the algorithm is going to tell you, oh, this little thing that you're doing right here is not as popular. It's gaining traction, but it's not as popular. And people want to hit. Everybody is so driven by charts and like, you know, and, and streams that they do what the algorithm is telling them because the algorithm is, you know, it's, it's not wrong. It's saying, hey, this is where the, the, the bulk of everything is happening. This is where the activity is. But it's stunting people and their willingness to jump out the window. And that's where, that's, that's the space that I live in. Yeah. You know? Every, every I, four to six years, I have a moment to jump out the window and do some crazy. It's just, I just got to make it work and I got to land it. Yeah. You know, it's like Simone Biles when she says, okay, um, and every four years, I got four years to do some crazy shit. <laughs> My only job is to be the illest at how I do it and I have to land it. Yeah, man. And that's, um, but now imagine if the, if the Olympics was was based on algorithms. Mm. What would her tricks be? What would she do? She wouldn't ever try that. Right? Because then there's the, the, the algorithm is saying, hey, if you tried this, you know, there's somebody that just did this in Arkansas, you know, on an off year, mm -hmm. an off season, year two. No love. But look, here's the thing. There's a high probability you might twist your ankle. And so before you know it, everyone just gets really good at doing the basic. Mm -hmm. Like, how great can you be at being basic? How great can you be at being the same? How great can you be at being cookie cutter? Like, I'm cookie cutter, you're cookie cutter, but guess what? My nose is still intact on the gingerbread cookie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And I'm just like, I'm just used to coming out of nowhere going, I'm a Jolly Rancher. <laughs> I'm staring at this plaque, like barely, because it's got a lot of lighting here, but this plaque of Lord Willing in my studio that people always come over and they're like, what did you do? Because I have a few like records I produce and then there's a couple from my DJ days. And and someone, and everyone's always like, because it's a cool plaque, it was such a great album cover, people love that yeah. album. And they're like, why do you have that? And I was like, well, because I guess... I actually do. I just remember when they gave it to me, I was like, why am I getting this? Or like, because you were playing grinding for like nine months before any other DJ here. And like, you know, yeah, a couple mm -hmm. people playing it in New York on the radio. And I was like, cool, that's great. I'll take it. It was probably my second plaque. But that idea that a record like grinding, a record like milkshake, like any record that's left field has to have this incubation time and time to be championed and allow it to grow. Because if you're, if you are disrupting, so to speak, to use a modern word with it, it's like, it, it takes a minute, it takes a minute to catch on. It only catch on if it's great, but mm -hmm. it, you know, that's why I loved England. And, you know, actually the, probably the first place I really felt the NERD, like the Nerd album, really, mm -hmm. with, as you, I'm sure you know, was, was yeah. in the UK because the UK Crazy. is small. So something catches fire. Zane Lowe plays it on Radio 1. It's from the north to the south of the country. Everybody's heard it. And if it's good, it can kind of ignite. Yeah. Uh, America's not like that. There's fucking 75,000 different markets and different tastes and things like that. So that sure. idea of even um, how... There was that trajectory. Think of someone like Biggie. You were like, you had your like underground single. Maybe it was like 
unbelievable and then you had your slightly commercial record juicy and then you were allowed to explode with the one more chance right like mm -hmm. that kind of growth that helped paint the picture of who an artist was and, and and really gave this like really interesting thing and gave you a lot of great records as well most importantly i don't know how if that is happening today i might be not aware but it feels like you've just got to come with your biggest thing and if you don't you don't really get that much of a second or third chance yep. right yeah, now hey, but your biggest thing is your melody is probably slightly derivative of something somebody's already heard and you're you know the music is it's just in this like it's in a it's in a very super familiar silhouette it's interesting man um but i you know i'm always up for the challenge i like it i got some i got a you know you say the alien sound and left field i man i got a couple of aliens coming and they only have yes they <laughs> only have left hands and left feet yes <laughs> That's great. And they all um, left-handed. Left I don't know if you guys got a chance to watch Mark's show, uh, watch, uh, watch the sound, but that show is, is awesome. Like, thank I, you. I really uh, appreciated like the context and everything that you gave to, you know, making beats, watching it like through your eyes, learn through the learning curve of people who uh, you thought were able to teach you, like Ariel or Kevin. Is there going to be a season two to that show? I believe not. <laughs> no, we did six. We did six episodes, and basically, what I wanted to do was we came up with. Um, we wanted to make. I, I did a TED talk on sampling like eight years ago, and the app, people from Apple came to me when they started Apple TV, and they're like, "We want to do a show that's kind of." nerdy and a little techy because you know that is also as well as apple being very cool and being huge now like the the heart of it is some you know we all love the geeky side and how good the gadgetry and all that stuff is so they're like we want to make a show about music so they hooked me up with this amazing director morgan neville who did 20 feet from stardom and morgan all is this the, stuff morgan and, is a genius yeah oh yeah of course oh sorry but yeah morgan genius and uh we said, let's do six episodes. Let's do sampling, reverb, auto-tune, synthesizers, drum machines, and distortion. Let's talk about six things that are in all of music somehow or like somehow influence and change the way music is made. And usually all of those things were sort of hated when they first came out. You know, distortion, all of these things, auto-tune. And then someone does something genius with them, Prince with the drum machine, with the Lindrum, and suddenly it's the greatest thing ever, and then everybody uses it. So basically, you know, by talking to the pioneers, everyone from Roger Lynn to Primo to Questlove to whoever about about these technologies and why they made it and see too short trying to remember how to program is 808 and all this kind of shit. like just we tried to make it always more more show than tell because that's when you're watching you can feel that and you get it but it was a joy to make it but i, I can't think of what else we would cover and uh, i mean you know it's, I, so i'm not sure that there's going to be a season two i had a suggestion for something tell me <laughs> i think context is one of the most underappreciated ways of listening to music because if you go to the 60s and you hear a song for the very first time and you're that person in the 60s, it changes how you feel about the song versus somebody like us who gets to hear it after there's been so much music that has been derivative of that initial new sound. And right. we'll never experience what they experienced unless we hear it from them and they convey it. I don't know if like, Yes, of course, if you were in 1965 and you heard You Really Got Me da -na 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 -na, for the first time, you'd be like, what the f***? But also, a 13-year-old kid hearing it in his bedroom for the first time now would have something close to that same visceral reaction, I think, because the really magic things do that. But think about all the music that's been derivative of that sound that that person's heard beforehand. And oh, then yeah. And they're going back. Yeah, no, I agree. You're never going to be like seeing that thing or seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan for the first time playing right. I Want to Hold Your Hand for sure. But uh, yeah. Like one of my favorite things to do on YouTube is go back to older music or like um, 
uh, a Larry Le Levon uh, DJ set, and you get to listen to the stories of people saying that they were in Studio 54 or wherever they were hearing him do his set from, and you get all this different context and stories of people being there. It's, it's really interesting. We think that with um, your, you know, how you got kind of got into the weeds technically with all this stuff uh, music related on your show, that we wanted to invite this surprise guest for you to interview and help us out here on our show. Oh dear. And okay. ask the right questions. Okay. So what we were going to do is bring someone in right now. <laughs> Mark's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted to introduce you to somebody you might know. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, this guy, Miles. <laughs> Miles, what how amazing. do you know all those things? I, I, I need to know about the, the EQing and the, I mean, everything. I'm so impressed. I loved it. Um, how are you? You good? Do you guys have met Miles? Since he, has, have you guys all met Miles before? Or not is he, him, is he regular on the show? No, we're familiar. No, we have not yeah. met Miles. What, what happened was I actually found Miles on Instagram, and then I saw that you were already following him, and I was quite impressed that you were. And I'm so impressed by Miles. I sent it to Pharrell and Fam, and everyone was blown away by it. And I thought, what a great opportunity to have him on here and talk about, you know, what's going on in his life. Yeah, Miles, where do you, where are you from? And tell me about when you first started making those beats and playing drums and all this kind of stuff. Um, I learned it just by figuring out it with him teaching me. Also, okay. I learned guitar all by myself. I was just playing around with it, and then all of a sudden I figured out it sometimes. Just for the people listening at home, Miles, how old are you? Um, I'm five and three quarters. Okay. Um, yeah, I love it when you were doing the, wow. when you were making the harmonies with your vocals, you're like, okay, I'm going to transpose this up 12 steps. And I mean, you're definitely a lot faster in yeah. logic than I am. And the scratching, how'd you learn how to mm -hmm. scratch? Um, I, I did that, um, like very recently. I, I learned it like. Somewhere, I think in October-ish, August thingy, and then my dad taught me. I was just like messing around with like moving the record back and forth. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I figured out how just to scratch. Yeah. You know, that's actually how Grandmaster Flash invented scratching, the very first person to ever scratch, because by accident he was going back and forth with the wreck, and he's like, this sounds cool. So you're basically the same as Grandmaster Flash. It's incredible. It's amazing. Miles, were you going to play some stuff and show us what, what's going on? So would you like to hear a song I was recently working on? I haven't finished it yet, but would you like to hear it? Okay, so I would love I'm to hear going it. to explain it while you're listening. So, um, this is what I started off with. I also reversed it. So, being reversed, it is this. Like this. 
I added a kick. I did the step effect to make room for the kick. Then I added a reverse cymbal. So the beat would drop. So I have this dropping beat. And um, I, let me show you. I have this bus 10 and um, over here, you see I changed the EQ and then that's what I did really. And this is what I did. I just copied the grand piano and upright studio bass and I just made that to be like um, in the beginning with a different EQ to be like this. And then I dropped it in some way with a reverse symbol. So what it really was is a, it, it sounds like this now, but I reverse it. So I actually went like this. Hold on, that was too early. Okay. And this is what exactly what I did. And then I reversed it to be like this, a reverse symbol. And now, just on the spot, I added an acoustic guitar. Let me show you what I did. I did it on this same acoustic guitar I have right cool. in my hands here. Cool. And, um, I just recorded this. Then you can play it on your side. I did it with the Vox. I added Vox. Also, I added Clap and Dark Pad just to make it like do it more smooth and like that clap. Just to be along with the snare so it doesn't sound so plain. But yeah, you could play it on your end with the vocals. I'm going to play it with my end, not the vocals. Or with, maybe I will. But I'm just, you are going to listen on your end with the vocals. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's, I'm gonna play I can't it wait. You're going to play it for us now. Vocals, and then you're going to okay. play it on your end. Okay. I I have mine. It's okay. Yeah. You can be down. So what I did is I actually made up the lyrics just on the spot. Oh, you did? You just freestyled the lyrics? Cool. I just, yeah. What's the song about? Like, it's, it's about, um, well, it's about when I had this friend in kindergarten called Elise. And then all of a sudden I was playing at recess and then she did... He told me she didn't want to be friends with me. I bet when she hears this song, she's going to be want to be friends again. Yeah. That is so awesome, man. Wow. Five and three quarters? Wow. Yeah, five and three quarters. Yeah. What's some of your favorite songs right now, Miles? What are your favorite songs to listen to by I other people? I have a lot. I got Band on the Run. I got Attention. Also... I've got Return of the Mac. <laughs> also, I've got, um, let's see so here. Playlist here? I got The Sims in My Eyes, The Sims is Your Eyes, I Have Nothing, The Blast, Happier Than Ever. Let's see here. Um, I got Can't Stop the Feeling, Crazy, Creep, Knocking on Heaven's Door, cool. GFC. 
What's who sings the blast? Is that Talib Kweli? Yeah, Talib Kweli. Wow, that's kind of amazing. That is amazing. I, you're going to be, I mean, you're already doing some amazing stuff at five and three quarters. Like, I don't even want to know. By this, when you're seven, when you're <laughs> yeah. nine, you're going to be making straight up <laughs> classics. So it's very exciting. I'm really excited to watch how you progress and keep making music because I've never seen so much talent and understanding of music and all the different instruments and this that engineering part and the plugins, all of somebody anywhere near your age it's it's amazing it's very exciting and even more impressive okay, having an opinion on, on, so on it i'm going to show you what was in the beginning of the video oh, it's okay it's okay no i'm going to show them. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay 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 so this is what you were actually saying. And <laughs> he was like, video. like I said. I was actually <laughs> hiding against, I have a shelf right here. Not there. I have a shelf right under. Um, but this is who was over there. I got my little stuffed animal bear. Right there. That's what, who was there at the beginning. And oh, I, right. I, okay. I, I fall asleep with him every day. I do everything with him every day. What's his name? What's it? His name is Bear. Mr. Bear. Bear? Mm -hmm. Does he play any instruments? Does he slap the bass? Mm -mm, no, he's just a stuffed no. animal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Mark, he's just a stuffed animal. <laughs> yeah. He's there for support and inspiration. Miles, you're awesome, Miles. Miles, you're amazing, and I yes. hope uh, you just keep working on music. Like he's feeling I... shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, nah, you are a very talented, young man. Very talented. Keep going. Thank you. <laughs> the next, the name of your next album should be called One Thousand Miles. One Thousand. Hey. Miles. Hey, I like that. A Thousand Miles. Miles. What's interesting is I thought, you know, from the videos, maybe his dad was setting him up what to say or what to do. There's zero chance of that after watching. No. Yeah, he's he not song. here. He on his it's own. It's all him. He yeah. He's dialing. He, he running this. That's amazing, man. No, I, so you found that. That's amazing because I remember when I first saw it, too, I was, I was like, couldn't wait to share, show it to everyone. I was like, is this for real? And the fact that he was like singing like, you lie to me, like the whole yeah. thing. Was, yeah. It was just yeah. playing the drums, just scratching all of it. I was like, and then obviously you guys posted it and, and Questlove posted it, but this is, you know, it's, it was very, it was very Future, fun man. and inspiring and actually good. That's what's so interesting about technology, I guess. I mean, is this the same as someone handing their kid a guitar and him just picking up the guitar and being a child prodigy of guitar versus handing them a computer and figuring it out. But like P just said, like he, he, he a math mind, so it's like, he see it different already, right? Yeah, 100%. That's amazing. You can't do all of that without being able to compute. His computational skills are in critical thinking. It's just, yeah. it's in another place. Yeah, like he's probably, yeah. how do you know to reverse anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know I'm saying? Like, how do you know? Were you, were you a good, P, were you a good, like, were you sort of a math-minded student in school and sciences and stuff like that? Or did, were you, were you like, a, were you like good no. in school and stuff? Hell no. I'm so blessed to be able to, <laughs> to do what I do because I was the worst. Yeah. I, I yeah. did not, I wasn't, school to me was recreation, fun, girls, skateboarding, um, Joking, yeah, and doing whatever I needed to do to at least get by to pass. Mm -hmm. I did not. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy education like I do now. Like I love, mm -hmm. love to learn. It's like my thing. Like I love, love, love. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like a great documentary or you know, or, or a book for me. Yeah. But and that's because I just didn't see it. It wasn't. Learning wasn't as interesting as hanging out and having fun. <clears throat> and yeah. I just wish I had somebody 
who could have appealed to me. And I know my mom is probably hearing this going, what the f like, <laughs> what do you mean? Because <laughs> she's, she's, a, she's a teacher. And, um, you know, she really got me, really wanted me to focus. And, and I just, I was like, mom, I don't, you know, school is just really so much fun. Yeah. I'm like really having a ball. Like, and I was one of those kids that like my sense of reality was so warped, you know, I get grounded for like getting bad grades and can't go out. And I'm like, you know, call my friends. I'm like, man, you know, my parents are f for everyone, man. <laughs> like they don't get it. Like they don't understand. You don't understand how much fun we have. And here they come with the, like party pooping. <laughs> Like, I mean, who does that? Who wakes up in the morning and goes, I know what I want to do. I want to poop a party. <laughs> it's like, man, this is like really like, how do you get off on this? Like you enjoy it. Do you understand how much fun you're preventing right now? And you got all ease. Man, my <laughs> shit was a yee. <laughs> or E D D D D C. C D. Or D D. Yeah, bro. I didn't get it. But now I love it. I I, I wish, and I know Mark, you're probably like you were genius in school. You were one of those guys we look at, man, how did you do it? And no, okay, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I think I, but um, yes, I think it was a, I think I was, I wasn't, I didn't have a good understanding of the sciences. I liked English and languages, but I wasn't looking to probably apply myself. By the time I was in high school, I was, have my band that was it like that was the thing that was exciting to me but um but i feel like there was probably i imagine some kind of very math part of your brain that you just obviously just didn't give it enough to do it in school but like from your music and stuff and your comprehension and the you know just from casual being a fan of your music i feel like i hear some of that in there whether you are tapped into it at that age, but it was coming out of the music, maybe. Oh, yeah, it's all math, 100%. I think math math is the universe, the universal language. It's the like language of the universe. And whether you're dealing with colors or you're dealing with music, math is in everything. And mm -hmm. some, of it, some of us are just, it's instinctive for us and in, other people have like an academic understanding of it as well. Um, but yeah, it's all math. And I think for me, I just, man, if it weren't for music, bro, I just, I don't know what the hell I would be doing. Seriously. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I was like, I was such a slacker. The only thing that made me become a workaholic was something I enjoyed. That's why I like, I try to tell kids all the time, man, do something that try to find a job that re that is related to something that you would do for free. You love it so much. Yeah. Then you'll mm -hmm. love your job. But because I'm telling you, I was a 100% slacker. Slacker. I was a loser. I really was. <laughs> I mean, nothing was nothing nothing was cooler than hanging out with my friends. My, my homeboy Cam had a car, and my, my and my boy Ganu had a car, and I'm just telling you that was like the highlight of our lives. It's just going to different high schools and talking to girls. I mean, well, that that's was not, that's not a loser. That's not necessarily. Yeah, a loser. but what is it? What did it? I mean, those are my boys, and yeah. I'm saying I wouldn't trade those those times for anything. I mean, again, it's like amazing. But you're slacking for sure. But no, but yeah, yeah academically, was, I was. Just, oh yeah, you was losing at school. But I'm slacking, saying. and I think education is the key to everything. Facts. You know, and um, I'm just grateful that I was able to find something that I love to do. But but Mark, what about you? I mean, you you said you 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 had you were excited about your band in high school. Yeah, that's cool. Like, yeah, I had my band in high school. Um. We weren't especially anything to write at home about, but you don't care at that point. You're just like, that's your life and your extended family is like the, the 30 people that come to your gigs and you're like a mini celebrity or whatever that is in that tiny <laughs> scene. But, but, and then, um, and then in senior year, it was like 92. And that's when I discovered DJing and I started listening to Stretch Armstrong and Flex and people on the radio. And it was like a great time. It was like, Black Moon, 
Mm. Pete Rock and CL Smooth's first wow. album. It was sort of like it was still like rap hadn't meet, reached this mass, and if you wanted to know about underground singles like that, you had to listen to special DJs. And so I started. I got, I saved up and got turntables for graduation, or rather, my mother got them for me for graduation, and I started to buy records, and that's when I really got into DJing. So, yeah, I guess I was going to college the first year because I wanted to keep. Yeah, you know, my mother happy in a way, and not have her just like you know break her heart by dropping out of college and just being a fuck up. But I just knew more and more that that's all I wanted to be doing, and I was taking the train back and forth from upstate New York like two or three times a week to DJ parties in the city, and I was just like, okay, this is ridiculous. So so that was it, and then I just I I I think I made up a little white lie and said that um. I was taking an academic leave of absence, but this, this I knew that that was not <laughs> the case. Oh, man, that's amazing <laughs> you were even, even able to say that. I couldn't say that. Mom, I'm taking yeah. a, 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 you know, an academic leave of absence. No, you're not. Yes. <laughs> sabbatical. I'm going on sabbatical. But, I mean, also, I was paying my own rent in this thing at this way. Like, oh, okay. I was paying my own way. So it's, it was not much, really, she could say. I was just how like, you, I'm good. this is my life rent? now. How are you doing that? Just because I was getting like three hundred dollars, or uh, maybe actually some of the gigs were like seventy-five dollars, to be honest. But like some were one hundred fifty, some were three hundred. Sometimes I'd, when I started like DJing, like I get twenty-two hundred dollars to DJ like the Martha Stewart office Christmas party, like what? whatever it was, <laughs> and uh, and and I and that was enough to you know make twelve hundred dollar a month rent and get pizza and occasionally. I mean, I had this amazing story of Puffy the first time he came in the club and I was DJing and he came up to me and he tried to give me $100. And I was like, I always felt weird taking money from people you don't know, even though I loved what he did. And I was like, no, no, it's totally cool, man. You make great music. You make my life easy. He's like, just take the money, man. And I was like, no, no, please, sir. Like, I'm like playing record. He's like, take the f money and like threw $100 at me. So I took it home. <laughs> and he had given me his number at the end of the night. And it was such a big deal that I put it in like one of those cheap plastic frames you could just buy at like whatever, the uh, pharmacy. And uh, put put it in the frame with his phone number and his name on it and the $100 and like put it in and hung it above my turntables. And then, uh, yeah, like two weeks later, I was like, oh, like I had, it's just hungry and I wanted pizza. So I, I had to it. take it down and break <laughs> it. So... But um, no, that was uh, that was that was a good time. Wow, crazy experience. <clears throat> That's funny. I was at the Boogie Nights premiere, and I saw a guy sitting in a booth drawing on a napkin, and it ended up being Tim at the after party, and it ended up being Tim Burton drawing what was a character from uh, one of his movies, uh, like going to be, and I just I don't oh even God. know why I said it to him. I was like, can I have that? And he handed it to me. And on the back, there's a phone number that I got from a girl. So, <laughs> so on wow. one side is his art, and it says Boogie Nights on it. And then on the other side is some random phone number and a girl's name. Wow. That's incredible. That must have been a Boogie Night. <laughs> <laughs> boogie. You still got um, it, Scott? Well, what's that? You, you ain't throw it away, did you? No, but it's actually interesting. Isn't that how you found one of your first uh, big songs, the sample from one of your first big songs was Boogie Nights? Oh, yeah, of course. Ooh Wee with um, Ghostface and Nate Dog. That was from, yeah. from Boogie Nights, the sunny Boney M. But what you just reminded me of is I have this thing, and this is Amy's original handwritten lyrics to Back to Black. And on it, she has this phone number that someone must have given her the night before in the club, it says Broncaz. And I remember because he used to have this blog before social media and all this stuff really called Last Night's Parties, where he was like this cool black guy who would go around in clubs and just photograph like, like oh, in yeah, these sketchy, cool, low East Side clubs, girls doing scandal. So he, whenever this gets posted, because this needs to go in a museum soon, obviously, um, he, he always hits me on Instagram. He's like, oh, that's my number. Like, da, da, da. I don't know if it's still his number, but it's pretty wild that, like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's a pleasure, man. Yeah, man, it's been great, man. Yeah. And we're long overdue. We ain't done nothing together. 
Let's do it. I will come to wherever you are, and I, I would love that. That would be wonderful. And I just like, even though we've run into each other and talked over the years, and you're always very uh, kind. Like I just like you, you. Honestly, your music is just like, as a DJ, as a fan of music, like has 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 been such an integral part of my past twenty years or whatever it is. So like, thank you for all of that. No, man, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. And honestly, like Scott said, like coming to, to them parties in New York and seeing you there and like then hearing your music on the radio and hearing your music like online, it's just been, you know, it continues to be, you know, a, a, a cool ride of like a mixture of like surprise, joy, and just like, you know, fearlessness that I think, you know, we need more of. So please, man. Thank keep you. Going and Thank you. Again, whenever you have a moment, we'll do something. I'm with it. Definitely. You like Love you're it. one of those guys, bro. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, everybody. Great. Yeah, thank you. Scott, Sam, good to see you guys.